So the title of our conversation around this subject, uh, which will be the last panel of the day, there'll be two shorter uh, quick segments after this, but this is the, the, the last uh, full-fledged co conversation. Uh, it's entitled The Visible Hand, Government's Role in Powering the Future. And to, to moderate this discussion, we have David Biello, who's the Environment and Energy Editor at Scientific American. Thanks, David, and it's, it's all yours. Everybody hear me? No? The green light is lit. It is. Is that on? Yeah, you're on. All right. So I'll assume that you can hear me. Uh, we are here to talk about the government. There's been a real uh, kind of whipsaw effect throughout the day here. Government is the enemy. Government is the worst thing that ever happened. And government is the solution. Uh, just, to, just to build off what uh, uh, the gentleman from Deutsche Bank said uh, about Brazilian sugar cane, I believe there were something like 30 years of government subsidies to make that globally competitive, just as a, uh, a point of contention. Um, so we have a great panel today. Uh, on my left is uh, Steve Coonan, who's the Undersecretary for Science, excuse me, at the US Department of Energy. Previously served at uh, the oil major you all know and love, uh, BP, as their chief scientist. Uh, to his left is Michael Levi, uh, Director of the Program on Energy Security and Climate Change at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, I believe, is called On Nuclear Terrorism. We're not going to talk about that today, sadly. Uh, and on his left is Lisa Marganelli, Director of the Energy Policy Initiative here at the New America Foundation and author of the excellent book, Oil on the Brain. Uh, it is not a neuroscience title. So, uh, without further ado, given uh, the fact that uh, the U.S., to keep things U.S.-centric, uh, gets something like 83% of its, of its energy from, uh, from fossil fuels, now we've got this great shale gas revolution, uh, and we heard Bruce Everett this morning, do we need anything else? Is there a, and if we do, what is, uh, what is government's role? And I'll start here and move down the line. So um, let, let me just say uh, by a bit of an advertisement, uh, I come off having spent um, roughly eight months thinking seriously about what does the Department of Energy do in energy. Uh, and uh, we put out a report about two weeks ago with the Secretary John Holdren and myself called the Quadrennial Technology Review. It's about 170 pages and uh, it's up on the web. Uh, energy.gov slash QTR, and everything I'll say in the next hour or so, uh, you can find in much more detail uh, in that document. So I would urge you to read it. Um, what can we do? I think it starts the government's role with a clear framing and understanding of what problem are we trying to solve. And are you trying to solve dependence on fossil fuels, trying to solve greenhouse gases, are you trying to solve the multiple problems that stem from oil. You're trying to solve US competitiveness. They're all different. They have different responses to different technology moves. So I think, first of all, a clear framing and understanding of what it is we're trying to do. So what are we trying to do? We are spending a lot of money on. Uh, well, we are spending a lot and a little. I mean, the, the energy research budget of the Department of Energy is $3 billion. And I can tell you, having sat in the private sector, uh, that's not chicken feed, but it's not an outrageous amount either. So more money, of course, would help. But what we are trying to do, I think, is deal with the oil problem, which has dimensions of balance of payments, uh, price volatility, jobs, physical insecurity, and greenhouse gases. And again, they're all different dimensions of the problem. Second, trying to deal with US competitiveness, restore energy technology manufacturing to this country. And the third, deal with environmental problems, most problematically greenhouse gases, but also water is a big deal as we think about producing energy. Uh, as to exactly what we'll do, I'll stop talking for a minute, but there's a lot more to say and turn it over to uh, some of my co-panelists. Yeah, Mike's going to tell us exactly yeah, what to do. Exactly what to do. I, look, I think Steve lays out some of the basic areas that uh, US energy policy needs to focus on. The market can do all sorts of fantastic things, uh, but it can't do everything. And there are sort of two basic areas that stand out as exceptions. One is environment writ large and climate change in particular. And the other I would take back to the relationship between 
uh, energy and particularly high and volatile oil prices in the U.S. economy. Because I think a lot of the security problems actually stem from that. And you can reduce a lot of them to that at its root. U.S. freedom of action is constrained because of the economic consequences of doing particular things in the world, uh, so on and so forth. I'm not going to lay out a, a, in detail what the U.S. government <laughs> should do on these things, but let me just give a sort of way that I like to think about this, and we were talking about this a bit before. I mean, you have to start by asking what the, what the problems are that you're trying to solve. And this is environment, uh, economic vulnerability, and so on. Uh, then you have to actually stop yourself and ask whether these are really energy problems. Uh, so, for example, we have a jobs problem right now that a lot of people seem to have decided as an energy problem, then they look for energy solutions. Uh, if it's not actually an energy problem, and it's a separate problem to do with other things in the economy, then you shouldn't be steering your energy policy toward trying to fix it. Uh, and the third piece is, once you've identified problems, you have to ask yourself whether there are decent solutions, policy solutions available. And not every problem has a solution. Some problems do have solutions, others don't. I think once you've answered those three questions, uh, you let yourself focus on the right set of measures and increase your odds of getting them right. So it seems like, though, that we have a pretty good sense of what the policy options that would be right would be. If we do have an environmental problem, we would like to put a price on carbon. That also seems to be utterly infeasible for political reasons. So how do we surmount that particular challenge? So I, I think you go after the problems that you can get consensus on and thereby make some progress on the carbon problem. So transportation, the oil problem, hits all three uh, dimensions, namely energy security, U.S. competitiveness, and greenhouse gases. And if you can get political consensus on the oil problem, we'll talk about what to do about it in a minute, then I think you can make progress on, on those things. And, and what about the impact on kind of everyday consumers? I know this is a big... Well, you know, it's interesting. The, the $3 billion that we spend on energy research at the DOE, we actually, that's two days' worth of gasoline in the United States. That's what consumers put out for two days' worth of gasoline. And this year we'll be spending um, $500 billion on gasoline alone. And then we've got diesel and, and, and fuel oils and, and uh, other things. So we've got this massive outflow of money, and that really complicates the politics of the oil. And it also kind of reveals something that's come up again and again today that I, I just think is so interesting is, we're very concerned about price, but part of the reason we're so concerned about price is we don't have any energy policy. We have a policy that runs on price, and that's not a philosophy. We don't, we don't have a guide to making decisions other than price. So what we do is we subsidize the oil on the one side, and we subsidize fuels, and we throw subsidies at ethanol, and we, we throw a lot of things on the supply side, including deals with Azerbaijan and all, all, all sorts of complicated things that can't be exactly quantified in dollars. We throw them into the supply side, and then we say, well, <clears throat> these electric cars, they're not competing. And you know, we haven't, we, would they ever have had a choice? Because we're so concerned with, t with price, and we're so concerned with tinkering with price, and then at the same time, we create this sort of playing field where it's very hard for the new technologies to, to come in. And so in some ways, what I kind of take away from this day so far, probably going to get educated during the rest of this discussion, is that you know, we're kind of starting to get towards the point of coming up with a philosophy, an actual philosophy of energy. And it's going to take a lot of sifting. Um, and right now, it sort of boils down to drill, baby, drill, and, and put a carbon tax on. And those, neither of those are, are viable practically. Um, sorry. Uh, neither of those are really viable practically. I think a carbon price is practical. But the problem is, is that when American consumers are spending $500 billion a year or $1.5 billion a day, and they're having a very hard time cutting back, they cannot imagine a carbon price. And so if you have to have a price of fuel that's going to cause them pain, no one's ever going to support it. Well, is a high oil price a good thing in that it incentivizes people to drive less and reduce our, uh, our oil demand? Or is it a bad thing because it's wrecking the economy, et cetera, et cetera? Well, a high market price for oil, absent whatever you want to add on top of it in taxes, is a bad thing. I mean, it creates incentives to make it a less bad thing. But <laughs> you have to put it in that framework. Right? If you would, well, you would frankly, everything else being equal, you'd much rather it be cheaper. Now you need to worry about a couple other things. Uh, there are externalities from a low price of oil. It means we don't prepare for higher prices. So if prices are volatile, we get into trouble. It means that we don't properly deal with 
uh, climate change, and that's where government can step in to change the prices or to create other incentives. I think we, we like to focus on prices because uh, they are, in theory, the economically optimal way of adjusting things. They may not be the most politically feasible. Uh, so you need to look, I think, in those two uh, parts. People tend to mash them together. I mean, to come back to Lisa's point, if government is taking the steps to make, let's say, uh, gasoline more expensive by charging more for it, it also has additional resources to help people who are vulnerable deal with the additional cost. Steve. So um, it's not only the magnitude of the price, but it's volatility, of course, that plays havoc. And that volatility will is inescapable as long as we rely on a liquid hydrocarbon that's fungible with oil. Uh, if we produce more domestically, uh, which is feasible, it's not a solution to the problem. We can't produce enough to swing the global market, and whatever we produce is going to get set at the global price anyway. So you hear a lot of political discussion about energy independence. Nonsense, OK? Absolute nonsense. Um, I, the example I like to use is the United Kingdom in the year 2000. Um, there were fuel riots that year. Michael, I don't know if you were there then or not. No, we we intersected. Yeah, OK, <laughs> before my time too. But anyway, at that time, <laughs> The, the price went up of petrol and diesel, got every, all the truckers upset and so on. But in fact, the UK was a net exporter of oil at the time. And so becoming energy independent does not make us price independent. The way we will get to be price independent, absent government intervention, and we don't have the money to do it in the government, is by going to a vehicle fuel that's not fungible with oil. And that means not ethanol, not advanced, gasoline like biofuels, but either natural gas or hydrogen or electricity. And of course, I have my opinions about those, but this is not the, well. Please share them. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Never thought you'd ask. Um, look, I, I think if you project out 20 or 30 years, probably the price of all three of those alternatives is within um, the uncertainty of your projections. But as we've thought through it in the Department of Energy, Electricity from the grid has a clear advantage in two senses. One is you can do it progressively. You can march down from internal combustion engine to hybrid to plug-in hybrid to all electric vehicles at a pace determined by how fast batteries get better. The second is the infrastructure integrates gracefully. We've got the ability to plug in at home already. You can put some charging stations out if you want, though they don't have much impact. Um, and you can do it gradually. A, a volt, when you plug it in, a Chevy volt, is about the same as a hair dryer. And so it's not a great stress on the grid to start with. And so we think the natural path will be uh, progressive electrification driven by the grid. But given the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, no, it's OK. Uh, uh, let me pick up quickly on this mm -hmm. volatility point. Uh, is I agree with Steve that the value of domestic production is often overstated in protecting uh, countries and consumers from volatility, but it's not zero, right? There are certain elements, and, and it's not all that close to zero. Right? There are certain elements of volatility that hurt you regardless of where you buy oil from because you transfer money from people who tend to spend it to people who don't, let's say oil companies. Um, and there are certain elements, for example, balance of payments, where having more domestic production, buying things from yourself, means that you are more insulated. So it depends on which, in terms of trade in as well. I mean, the, the sort of economic shock from having to buy more expensive stuff from abroad while the value of the stuff you're selling doesn't go up uh, actually is a real thing. So I think you need to separate those pieces. The other thing I just wanted to sort of observe, we've been talking about, it's interesting because uh, we've been talking about very high level policies right now. It's an incentive to use less oil, to use different fuels, and so on. And that's one market failure, right? We don't have the right incentives to use these things. Uh, but there's another big market failure, which is that even if in the long run those incentives are there, the right capacity to innovate, to develop technologies, to commercialize those technologies isn't there. I mean, this is what Steve spends all his time trying to fix. Uh, but those aren't there. And even if you had the right carbon price or the right price for gasoline and so on, it doesn't mean that the technologies would materialize. So that's another, uh, another market failure we need to be figuring out how to solve. Lisa, I think you were going to say something. Oh, uh, well, I, I'm very curious about what you're saying about um, basically thinking defensively about non-fungible fuels. So 
because uh, this is actually, I hadn't actually heard that, uh, that sort of argument against biofuels, which is what I take it to be. Um, <laughs> uh, and that yeah. there would be, you know, if, if, if security <coughs> is, is really an issue for us, then this is, the, the way is forward is through electrification and natural gas? Yeah, so if, if you could produce biofuels at less than the market price, you'd be a fool to sell them at anything less oh, than I, the Oh, I understand and that. Conversely, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So we think that there's a role for biofuels, but it's in the diesel-like biofuels mm -hmm. uh, to do the greenhouse gas thing for the heavy duty mm -hmm. sector, as opposed to the passenger cars, where we can see demand going down. Mm -hmm. um, so you're right. sort of talking then about a much more active government role in determining who gets what kind of car or how the market starts to behave. Well, well, the first thing that we do, we did, was to crank up the CAFE standards. Mm -hmm. right? And you can actually get a long way with a conventional internal combustion engine, pay a couple thousand more per car, and get the mileage up significantly. Uh, one of the other things, just by the by, because we measure fuel economy in miles per gallon, as opposed to the sensible gallons per mile, the first few miles per gallon matter the most. <clears throat> and so going from 30 to 50 miles a gallon uh, saves as much as going from 50 to 150 miles a gallon. So um, I think you can get a long way just with conventional engines and uh, um, ordinary oil. So, but I wonder what the political reaction will be of people as, as they say, well, uh, you know, I, we, in some ways we do have a segmented market but because a lot of states kind of prohibit cars with diesel engines. And that's, it's kind of been pushed over more towards, towards trucks. But, um, but I wonder, I, I guess what I've, what I've been kind of fretting about as I think about this issue of, of coming up with an energy policy is, is we have had this kind of um, not a real discussion about this for years and years. And we have all these different people now jockeying in the, in, in the political arena looking for attention and also looking for money from the government. And, uh, and we're kind of coming out of this phase. Um, and uh, it seems to me that, that people are becoming somewhat suspicious of green energy. Um, and there may be sort of limits to political tolerance for some of what people want. And there's also the government hostility that has been sort of noted. <laughs> there's this <laughs> alternate uh, like sort of deep interest in government and deep hostility. And I wonder you know, how that's going to work out. Are people going to be OK with? Um, with this change in the cars if it's not completely transparent to them. Let me pick up on that, that quickly. I sympathize with it, but at the same time, I think that the public policy incentives and individual incentives might be more aligned than, uh, than we're on to here. If I'm an individual and I'm facing a world where I don't seem to be able to figure out whether gas is going to cost $2 or $5 in a year, I'm going to be interested, more interested, in the vehicle whose cost of operation is the least sensitive to the price of gasoline. Now, I'm not going to start with the assumption the American people know that something they can do with biofuels is going to be more sensitive than something they can do with, uh, electric with electricity. Mm -hmm. But that's an information gap that you can attempt to solve. I think if people knew that they could sort of get out of this business of worrying about what the price of gas will be next year, uh, it, demand for electrification might increase substantially. So there may be some alignment. You, you know, there are. When we think about technology change, and I assume this came up earlier in the day, but I'll give you my own spin on it. There are certain structural factors about energy that just make it extraordinarily slow to change. Uh, it's got to do with the long life and high capital cost of assets. It's got to do with the need to interoperability of various parts of the system. It's got to do with the fact that fuels and electrons are commodities with thin margins inducing technological conservatism. So the folks who run the energy system, whether it's the oil companies, the cars, the power companies, and so on, they're not dumb. They're just trying to optimize the investment on the capital. Well, yeah. when you look at energy transitions of the past, you know, uh, according to Václav Smil, the, the, the preeminent thinker on this, it's 50 yeah. plus years, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that government can do to speed energy transitions. That seems to be what government is undertaking to do. How are you going to do it? Or how should government do it? Government can do anything it wants as long as it's got the political and financial capital. And we don't have much of either these days, right, uh, to do that. 
Um, I think it is in the so end. So subsidies are going away. Subsidies Georgia are going Bank away. Was right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, um, we, what can government do? I think we set the regulatory framework. We try to push the standards commensurate with the technology toward the goals we want, whether it's reduction in oil use or greenhouse gases or whatever. Uh, and then the second is we fund pre-competitive research. Government does that very well. We convene players. The Department of Energy has a big role in convening different parts of the power sector, the whole biofuels chain. We also set the agenda. When the Department of Energy says hydrogen, everybody marches in that direction. We say batteries that direction, we say nuclear, et cetera, et cetera. So we have an agenda setting capability. We've seen that. We, we, uh, yes. <laughs> it, it has been, we can argue whether it's been exercised promiscuously or not, but it has I believe been. it was called uh, flings uh, earlier uh, uh, in the uh, day. Uh, very good, all right. And, and then we do, and, and we, we need to do them, but I think with greater care, we do big demos. And whether it's a billion dollars for a CCS plant or a couple hundred million for a small modular reactor, I mean, we do those as well. And the Department of Energy um, engages in all three of those kinds of activities. Is, is that enough? I would say that we need to. It, one of the things that's happening is we're getting these newer, much more efficient cars into the system, through, partly through CAFE. Everything that's coming out now is much more efficient than it used to be, especially if it's in the sort of subcompact and smaller size, very efficient. Um, and we're obviously moving in that direction. Uh, and um, the interesting thing, when you look at the electric cars that are coming into the market, and you talk to people who are using them, um, for one thing, they, they sound like Woody Allen characters, because uh, I, I was at a conference, and they, there were two guys walking behind me talking very intensely about range anxiety, which I, I just, I'd never heard it outside the use of technicians. But basically, these things are, are, are becoming quite a bit more mainstream, even to the people who are designing plug-in Priuses. Um, and we're ending up with kind of uh, an, an upper tier of efficiency for US drivers who are much, who have a lot more money at their disposal. And then we have a lot of people in, I would say, the working class or the lower middle class who are driving the least efficient cars in the market. Um, many of them are, are uh, old SUVs which sell at a very, very low price if you're buying a car for cash or if you are dependent upon really expensive credit. And, and so we're sort of moving to this, this system of, of two tiers where one tier gets to, to choose what kind of car and what kind of mileage they're getting and the other tier is sort of at, at a drift in the credit markets going for whatever car is available and then trying to drive that car further and further to the jobs that are available. And in interviewing people about this, I mean, this, this just, it's distressing. You know, when Paul Sankey was up here and he was talking about the pain that's gonna cause people to change their behavior, what he's actually talking about is a lot of upset. He's talking about people who can't pay their bills. He's talking about people whose cars break and they can no longer make it to work. He's talking about, especially at that lower, the lower end, just a big mush. And I think what has to happen is that the government and needs to take kind of a proactive role in getting people out of these old cars. We need like a cash for clunkers or a credit for, credit for Priuses or something. Not necessarily Priuses. It could be actually, it could easily be any kind of but higher, more efficient we, car. We have that, essentially. I mean, we, we have the rebates for electrical, uh, electric vehicles. Those we are, have. I'm not saying oh, yeah. they're within reach, but I'm saying that is the attempt that the government has made. I mean, right. So, yeah. I mean, it takes us to a, a, another set of innovations that we need. We talk about innovation in terms of technology. We also need innovation in the financial space. You know, innovation has become a four-letter word in the financial <laughs> space. Uh, but it's hugely important here, whether it is innovation and financing for energy efficient homes or innovation and financing for people to get uh, different vehicles uh, that allow them to actually make intelligent decisions rather than focusing too much on the upfront costs and too little on the cost behind it. We can talk about innovation for financial innovation for technological innovation, but that's another uh, story. The problem, of course, is that our recent experience with government subsidies for consumer credit has not been entirely positive. Um, and so whether it is, it may be technically possible to imagine schemes that would be effective, it is not necessarily realistic either to imagine they would be accepted by the public or that they would be implemented the way that uh, you, know, you or I would write them down on a piece of paper and uh, publish in a nice energy journal. So, so two comments, Michael. Uh, one is, I don't know much about finance, I'm just a <laughs> physicist guy. 
But I do know that if the total life cycle cost of a technology is bigger than the alternative, no amount of financing is going That's to make that different. Right? And currently, we yes. are like that. Yes. Um, the second is one should not underestimate uh, the slowness of the transition that you mentioned, uh, quoted Smillin. Um, hybrid vehicles went on sale in the U.S. about a decade ago. There are a million and a half of them on the road currently out of 240 million light duty vehicles. Uh, hybrids are currently 3% of light duty sales. Uh, sales, which is just the new vehicles. So it's going to take a really long time unless there is some external government push. That doesn't solve the tier problem that, no. that Lisa no. is talking about. But but I, I think that there, there is room, though, to, to do a, one, what I think what you're referring to is that, in part, the price of gasoline, because it's volatile here, is perceived to be lower. And so we don't have the kind of push into the marketplace for electric vehicles that they have in Europe or in China, where there's a different sort of government push. And we need to figure out what that push is going to be if we think these are important. And there's probably there's a lot of different ways to do that, but we're not, we're not doing that. And I think what I'm saying is when we do that, we need to make the middle class part of it. What we've done is we've sort of focused on early adopters so far and, and people with a fair amount of cash on hand. I just wanted to make a small point on, the, I think we need to be clear about the distinction between electric vehicles and more efficient internal combustion engines. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of internal combustion engine based vehicles that would be economically smart for people to buy, but which they don't buy because of capital yeah. constraints. I, I should also make clear, I mean, my sense, never mind the broader government, is not to push electric vehicles. The goal, the problem is to reduce the exposure to oil volatility and all the baggage that comes along with oil. And if you can get there with more efficient internal combustion engines, let's do it. Yeah, so why not focus on standards more, which, which have th throughout history kind of uh, uh, delivered more return? Wow. Than, than kind of the, the quote unquote breakthrough technologies. If you look at California, if you look at cafe standards that you mentioned, standards are, are, are where it's at if you want to reduce volatility. Uh, we, we have done a lot on, uh, we're focusing mostly on transportation. Mm -hmm. if we have done a lot on standards and uh, we go up to 50 some odd miles a gallon by 2022, if that's what's proposed. That's pretty good. Do you think we need to do more? I. Th Michael, you Anybody? Uh, with is the, that enough? I mean, does that really solve the problem? You need well, to firstly, what, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, firstly, which is the problem? There are multiple problems. It's not one solution for all of them. We've been talking about transportation here, so we're mostly talking about oil consumption, which hits multiple problems, but uh, certainly for the climate problem is only a, a slice of it. Um, uh, could you do more with uh, fuel efficiency standards? In the long term, yes. I think this administration has been quite aggressive on fuel efficiency standards. Uh, there's also a point of diminishing returns with fuel efficiency standards uh, on two sides. Uh, one, uh, you know, this rebound effect where people use vehicles more doesn't, doesn't get rid of the impact, but it can, it can hit it, particularly in industrial applications where people are already uh, looking at their numbers. Um, and on the flip side, just because you set the standards doesn't mean people will have the technology to uh, deliver properly on it. So you still need to help make sure that that's there. Yeah, yeah, we, we, the government, need to keep pushing the pre-competitive technology. In the vehicles, it's light weighting, it's more efficient uh, simulation of internal combustion engines, and then it's the batteries, which has already, of course, been mentioned today, mm -hmm. and the advanced biofuels for diesel. So this, this, last, this, uh, this last point about simulation is also really important. Uh, it's a reminder that even though we talk a lot about energy innovation, there's only so far you can push innovation in one sector out in front of innovation across the board in technology. I mean, we've heard about, I mean, people have been talking today about uh, what we've learned from biotechnology that can be applied to dealing with energy problems. We talk about computing as it applies to energy technology. I mean, you, that doesn't mean that you should just sort of be extremely broad and never focus on anything energy specific, but uh, moving your bets from one pile to another doesn't necessarily get you where you want to go in the long term. You need that broader environment uh, where there are innovations to borrow from all sorts of other places. Mm -hmm. I think another role for government is in um, looking out for problems that lie ahead. And, and one of the issues with electric vehicles in particular is, um, is uh, rare earth metals like neodymium, which now come <coughs> mostly from China. We have a, a mine here in the US, and um, uh, they're going back online to produce them. But they're certainly never going to be up at, at sort of world uh, domination levels. Um, 
And figuring out, uh, in some ways, the life cycle of the ingredients of the cars is going to be increasingly a task for government to coordinate, whether we do it in a Japanese sort of style where the government coordinates industry, or whether we do it in sort of more our own fashion where you convene government, I mean, where you convene industry to figure out what they're going to do. Um, there's really no excuse for, for some of these components to be um, heading off to the scrap heap. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have an extensive program to look at replacements, minimize use, and then uh, recycle uh, ultimately for those metals. So the four-letter word in energy has been brought up a couple of times now by you, Lisa. That's uh, China. <laughs> uh, earlier today, the point was made that uh, perhaps uh, national c competition doesn't matter. Yet when we talk about oil or, or, or EVs or, or whatever else, um, uh, it's always uh, kind of pitched in the, uh, in the realm of competition with China or, or competition with, uh, let's say, Asian battery makers. Uh, does not national competition matter? And if so, why? Look, uh, there are, if you compare U.S. and China, again, structural differences. They're building their infrastructure new, cost of labor regulations, cost of capital, willingness of the government to get more tightly coupled with the private sector there. These are all things that tip the playing field in one direction, or uh, actually in the Chinese direction. If <laughs> we want to remain a competitive economy, never mind whether it's energy or anything else, uh, we probably need to re-examine how we do things in this country. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at, let's say, the U.S.-China relationship, I mean, part of it is win-win. I think that's what people were suggesting. And then part of it is win-lose. And you have to distinguish between those and focus on correcting the win-lose pieces and intensifying the win-win. So uh, look at the solar market. People like to talk about the solar market a lot and about how uh, solar panel manufacturing is not happening here, it's happening in China. Mm -hmm. What well, happens in China primarily, at least for now, with ultra-pure silicon that's made elsewhere, including in particular in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have cheap solar panels to sell because of the cheap assembly, you may not have the same market for the ultra-pure silicon. Uh, so you can imagine a win-win sort of thing, where different countries specialize in things that they're better at, and together they all gain. Uh, you can also find situations where, because of subsidies or tariffs or non-tariff barriers and so on, or because government is uh, unwilling to properly partner with the private sector to develop technologies, that there is a win-lose, where one side simply gains market share at the expense of the other, and something that the other is quite capable in principle of doing. Um, and the United States needs to make sure that it doesn't lose out on those, and that part of that is a good trade policy. Uh, it's not about fighting these fights alone, because it's not the United States alone that is concerned with some of the policies that China uh, adopts. India, for example, has uh, local content requirements for its solar industry primarily to protect itself from China, mm -hmm. uh, not from uh, the United States. Uh, so we need to do that together with others. And we need, again, to take a broad view from our own standpoint. It's not just about you know, getting the right energy technology firm started. It's about having good science, technology, education, things like this. So when innovations happen wherever they happen, firms can set themselves up in the United States to take advantage of them. But before, I, would add, uh, yeah. I gotta open it up to the audience at, at some point. Okay. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that we talk about something besides cars. <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're here in DC and uh, obviously uh, the, the talk of the past couple of weeks in energy has been uh, Solyndra. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk about productive failures and their importance in, um, in energy development. Could Solyndra be viewed as a productive failure? I think, uh, it t as they say, time will tell whether Solyndra was a productive failure. Solyndra is really typical of something that happens, and it, it is in relationship to this discussion about China that it happens, is that rather than trying to do what we do well, we try to do what the Chinese do well, which is subsidize the heck out of things. And um, that works really well in China because they're essentially, they, they need to create uh, the equivalent of jobs for the population of Australia every year. Um, and, and they have a, a lot of incentives that don't exactly have to do with money, that have to do with keeping stability by generating those jobs. So um, people, we, we also talk about batteries. You know, shouldn't we be subsidizing a battery industry? Well, no, because n everybody subsidizes batteries because it's a subsidized industry. That's their commodity. The thing is, is that we could change our own standards here, make it so that the things need to be created here, and, and so that there's technology. One of the things that scares me about Solyndra is we put... We as taxpayers put um, $535 billion into it. Yep. 
Uh, mil yeah. Million, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thankfully it was million. Million, thank goodness, <laughs> yes. So it was these you know, millions of dollars. And, and then it goes bankrupt, and who gets to buy that? Now from what I understand is the DOE actually took the, got some of the rights to the intellectual property, and I don't know if that was just a rumor. But what ha has happened traditionally in, in California, for example, is we funded through the 80s and early 90s, we put tremendous funds into our wind and solar industry. And then we, uh, we, we didn't sort of have firm political buy-in, and we had this sort of subsidy structure that then toppled. And the, place that the companies went bankrupt, and then their technology was bought by people outside the, the US. And so we essentially, we as taxpayers, had funded um, great businesses for Denmark. Yeah. Um, and and yes, that's yes. kind of the scary thing about Solyndra is, you know, did we just do that? But Please. So several comments about Solyndra. Um, I, so I'm not a political type, as I've mentioned already. Um, but it seems to me curious that when Congress writes a law that says the government should extend loan guarantees and take greater risk than the private sector, um, sometimes things are not going to work out. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that. The political system seems to have difficulty understanding that. Solyndra was not a particularly productive failure, in my opinion. It was a business failure, not a technology failure. The technology is working fine, mm -hmm. just happens to be the wrong technology for the current market conditions, which were not the market conditions when the deal was done. Uh, and the last was, um, you know, the government perhaps went out on a limb, but a billion dollars of private sector money went out on the limb with us. Uh, and so it was not as though this was a um, particularly contentious call in terms of the private sector um, putting money in. I, mean, I think this uh, email, repeatedly quoted email from Larry Summers captured things quite well. Government is a crappy VC, but the problem is that VCs are fairly crappy VCs Good. in this space Good. as well. Uh, the second part is mine, the first part is his. That's right. Um, um, look, VCs are really good at doing certain things. They're good at doing things that involve uh, three to five year commitments of a certain amount of money, which is generally smaller than the amount of money involved in most energy things. Uh, Timelines are, are shorter, and so they don't necessarily, they, yeah. they, we create all sorts of innovations. They may not solve the social problems that we're interested in solving. Uh, and it's worth you know, taking the long view and going back into history, uh, once upon a time VC didn't exist either. Right? If you go back to World War II and the immediate aftermath of World War II, if you had the kinds of things that VCs do today, you would turn to the government to fund them. A VC was essentially a failed financial model for almost 30 years uh, until an obscure change in Department of Labor, Labor regulations on pension investments basically allowed it to explode. Uh, maybe there are financial innovations out there that will allow investors to put uh, money into the kinds of technological risks that we need to deliver on energy solutions. Uh, there may also be a role for government to make those uh, new financing approaches happen, and I know there are a lot of lawmakers looking at different ways to do that. Uh, so there's the potential for innovation there, but just because a lot of private investors are pouring in money, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, does not necessarily mean that they're making good bets or that what they are supporting will give us what we want. And, and how does that play into our competition with, uh, with, with China? We just have a different model, right? We have a model. We have a model that says you start small with risk finance and then you grow up and then the big company buys you and integrates it in what it does. That's roughly how we do things. It's not totally clear that that quite works in the energy space because not everything can actually start small. Uh, so the Chinese model has a ton of money in these big state owned enterprises. Frankly, it doesn't feel all that different from what you know, Bell Labs used to be able to do once upon a time, or IBM when they had big in-house research departments. Uh, but it's not clear that within the Chinese model, you have that competitive discipline that you need to actually take that large scale of patient capital and turn it into something uh, useful on a consistent basis. Uh, I think people are going to be looking for the right blend of government and private in order to uh, solve some of these problems. But they have and so much capital. So, a lot of capital so, that you can see. You know, it's not just about money. I want to yeah. talk about Chinese innovation in a different dimension in high performance computing. Last November, I visited the Institute for Computing Technology in Beijing. This is a Chinese Academy of Sciences operation, a palatial building right next to Tsinghua University. A thousand of the best Chinese graduate students, 500 professional staff who see their job as to spin out companies. And they spun out Lenovo, and they spun out Dawning, 
and they're spinning out many others. The faculty sit on the boards of these companies, and they take an equity return from those companies to continue to fund the operation. It's a completely different organization. It's like a university um, tech transfer operation on steroids, if you like. And um, you know, it's a different way of doing things that doesn't require massive subsidies, but looks pretty effective, actually. And I want to make sure we have some time for, for questions from the audience, if there are any. If there aren't, I'm going to let Lisa jump in right there. Uh, real quick, um, so uh, you know, right now we're talking about things like sort of dealing with externalities, climate being a classic, and and that's really a public good. And one of the challenges for the for investors is that they can't capture a share of that market. You know, that's a good that that sort of everyone enjoys, and that's tr traditionally been uh, the, the the role of government. That's that's a, a classic role for government to take. But in recessionary times, it's one we can't afford to do. So, are we really thinking about sort of a two phase? energy policy where in poor times we sort of have one tack and when we're fat and sassy, assuming that ever happens again, we have another that's more oriented toward the public good? It's certainly a lot easier to talk about public goods in fat times. Um, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, features of the climate problem uh, is that the time scales are pretty long. It's going to take decades for the CO2 to build up, et cetera. Um, so at least in the U.S., I think we've got some time. Where I get more worried is in the developing world, which is building the infrastructure and locking in. Um, so I don't know if that helps, but there are different aspects of this uh, do it now or do it later problem. I think that um, part of also what's happening is that uh, the sort of the default energy policy we were going to have was a carbon policy. Um, and, and before that, actually, a lot of energy policy was kind of done behind closed doors by some very high-level sort of wonks. There was a, a whole early, um, the first Bush administration had a, a sort of an unspoken energy policy that they put in place. And a lot of this didn't used to be kind of exposed to the light of day. And what's happening is with the internet and, 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 and the in information is that information and energy policy are getting very intertwined and people are having opinions before well, it's just, it's becoming something that, that gets batted about a lot more. D the very idea of people chanting, drill, baby, drill, and getting other people to chant, drill, baby, drill, would have, I think, been unthinkable 20 years ago. So what we're looking at is that this sort of matrix of, of the internet and, and real um, political involvement is kind of overlaying with this trying to articulate an energy policy. It's, it's, uh, it's Twitter's fault. Hmm. <laughs> no, it's but, our fault. But I, like, <laughs> I like everything else. No, I, I also think you framed it well. We have a habit of revisiting our strategy for various 30-year problems every time there's a three-year change mm -hmm. in how the political system is functioning. And there's been at least five articles in the last week trying to understand what happened to climate change in U.S. policy with all sorts of elaborate theories to do with you know, climate gate and cold winters and whatever. Well, Nothing else has passed Congress in the last three years either. Uh, it's not, there's nothing special about climate policy right now. Uh, so I think we've got to be careful to, yes, to adapt to big trends, but not to try and rewrite strategy every time something changes for a few years. Uh, I, the first hand I saw was right here. I guess one of the questions we're talking about this issue of national uh, uh, energy policy is that if you look at the U.S. and you travel outside of the Northeast Corridor and the Pacific Coast, you start to get different views. Uh, and part of the reason is because a number of the regions and states in the U.S. are net energy exporters. And they have the attitude of exporters. If you want a, a local non-U.S. view of that, go to Alberta. So I think one of the challenges with an energy policy, and here's your comments, is how do, one, can you have one when you have this kind of split? Uh, but secondly, how do you accommodate the fact that there are areas of the U.S., uh, I mean, I was triggered by your comment, drill, baby, drill. Uh, what would happen to Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and all these if you don't? So, so this is, oh. is going to be our last question because we're running out of time. And okay. uh, I, I would sum it up as uh, uh, government is broken and uh, uh, can we ever <laughs> fix it? <laughs> 
Do you, do you want me to take a, yeah, a OK. Please. So um, please. Uh, what I would say is, yes, we do actually have two different, very different realities in the US. And what's happening with the national, natural gas boom, the, especially um, uh, the shale gas boom, is that it's taking places like upstate New York and, and challenging them to whether or not they want to have, have drilling equipment on their land. And people in upstate New York are seeing this as a property rights issue because they never did what Oklahoma did. And they never acted like, like, like Texas did. In Texas, if somebody comes on your land and says, I'm going to drill, you say, oh, OK, yeah, I kind of figured you did. But uh, you know, send me the check, exactly. <laughs> they say anything except. If you're lucky enough to own the mineral rights. That right. isn't well, yeah, the exactly. issue in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. It is in New York and Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Don, I think the way you square the circle, this is Steve talking, not the administration. Uh, and, and I'll talk about oil, not gas, because they're different situations. I think you adopt the Norway strategy. And that is that you produce like crazy, sell it either domestically or on the open market, do it responsibly, of course, environmentally sound, and at the same time reduce your dependence through efficiency, electrification, whatever. That you know probably satisfies both constituencies, hits the jobs and economic issue, and at the same time addresses climate, economic vulnerability, and so on. The I think only, the only thing it doesn't address is what do we do in 50 years? Right. Most um, people don't make 50-year decisions in. Yeah. In politics, look, there are a couple different theories of how you do it. The one that has been tried is you collect a lot of money through your policy and you hand it out to the people who are going to be hurt in the long term to make them happy in the short term. That was roughly the design of some of the climate policy that was attempted earlier. This administration didn't quite uh, work. There are, other, uh, there are other ways of trying to handle things, but fundamentally, uh, you probably can't help with winners and losers over the very long term, but you can help with transitions. Those other ways are going to have to wait for a hallway uh, conversation because we're out of time. I, I want you to join me in, in thanking our excellent panelists. I'm a little disappointed there were no, no fisticuffs, but I, I appreciate oh, the, the liveliness.